Today, we're lucky to have two authors presenting, DM Testa and Shane Davidson. DM Testa is the author of Defending the Dillinger Gang, Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins in the Courtroom. Shane Davidson is the author of Queen of the Burglars, The Scandalous Life of Sophie Lyons. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of our presenters, and then I'll turn it over to them. DM Testa is originally from Northwest Ohio, which she visits on a regular basis, and she currently lives and works in Western New York State. A deeply held fascination for events from the past, along with a childhood spent sliding across the marble floors of a bank John Dillinger robbed, provided much of her inspiration for writing Defending the Dillinger Gang. Shane Davidson is a native, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a native of St. Louis, Missouri, and she holds a BFA from the California Institute of the Arts and an MFA from the University of Michigan. After working for three decades as a medical illustrator, Shane turned her eye to her first loves, writing and genealogy. Her previous books are Captured and Exposed, The First Police Rogues Gallery in America, and Civil War Soldiers, Discovering the Men of the 25th United States Colored Troops. And with that, I'll turn it over to the presenters. Thank you, John. Uh, we are really happy to be with you today. And uh, we're gonna be talking about three unusual women whose lives broke from the norms of their day. Sophie Lyons, Jesse Levy, and Bess Robbins. All three were ahead of their time, but make no mistake, they were on opposite sides of the law. Sophie was a successful criminal during the 19th and early 20th centuries at a time when career criminals were mostly men and Jessie and Bess were among the first women to practice criminal law in the early 20th century. Together, uh, they represented six members of the John Dillinger gang, a number far greater than their male counterparts. But these three women had more in common than one might think. Sophie and Jesse were Jewish immigrants whose families came to America fleeing persecution in Europe. And Bess was a first generation American also born to a Jewish family. All three were bright, ambitious and eager to take on roles outside the expected norm. Now in the 19th century, uh, when a woman got married, her property became her husband's except in a few, a very few uh, cases. Men were the primary wage earners, while women were expected to be responsible for housework and childcare, and women were excluded from most jobs. Uh, careers available to women were confined to a few specialties, often seen as an extension of women's domestic responsibilities. Working class women in particular struggled to support themselves and their families with low paying, low status jobs such as the sweated labor in the textile trades. Middle and upper class women generally didn't work outside the home. So my book, Queen of the Burglars, is a biography of a criminal named Sophie Lyons. And we're gonna start with her because we're going farthest back in time and then we'll be moving forward. Uh, 100 years ago, Sophie needed no introduction. If people hadn't heard of her already, they, got to, they had gotten to know her in 1886 when Thomas Burns, head of the NYPD Detective Bureau in New York City, published his book, Professional Criminals of America. The book was a compilation of mugshots and biographies of 204 notorious criminals. Sophie was one of only 18 women Burns included in his book. And here you see her uh, uh, in, one of the, in a page from the book. Uh, she, so there were fewer than 10% professional criminals uh, were women at that time. And uh, so Sophie published her own memoir in 1913. And by then gallons of ink had been spent recounting her criminal adventures. So in order to write my biography, I set out to determine what was fact and what was fiction. Uh, I used genealogical sources to create a family tree for her. And I found criminal records and newspaper articles to build a timeline of her life. I also discovered documents from the appeal of her estate to the Michigan Supreme Court that contained firsthand accounts of her life from family and friends. 
So let's explore Sophie Lyons, a woman who was on the wrong side of the law for most of her life. Sarah Sophie Van Elken was born in Germany in 1847. Her parents came as immigrants to America in 1854. The following year, Sophie and her siblings and cousins arrived in New York City, so they traveled separately from the adults. The Van Elken family settled on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a place known for poverty and criminal gangs at that time. And if you've watched TV shows like Copper or The Alienist, you'll have a sense of what life was like then in this part of New York City. For the poor, it meant living in crowded and squalid conditions. Sophie's parents, Jacob and Mary, made their living through crime. Jacob was a fence who sold, who sold stolen goods, and Mary was a shoplifter and pickpocket. The couple trained their children to be criminals. Mary coached Sophie in pickpocketing when she was still a child and forced her to steal. She dressed the little girl in nice clothing so she would fit in and then mother and daughter rode the ferries and went to stores and museums in the wealthier parts of New York City. Sophie was beaten if she didn't work hard enough at her job of pickpocketing and shoplifting. So Sophie, not surprisingly, was arrested several times while she was still a child. And later in life, she recalled how she enjoyed being arrested. And this is truly sad because the officers gave her candy and it got her away from the beatings and the strife of her life at home. In 1860, when she was 12, Sophie was convicted of burglary and sent to a juvenile detention facility on Randall's Island called the House of Refuge. The House of Refuge could only be accessed by boat, which meant it was impossible to, to escape from. And even though the idea was to train young people and help them join honest society, conditions there were very harsh. Corporal punishment was used regularly on the, on the inmates and discipline was very rigidly enforced. Unlike the pre, her previous arrests, when she might've been given candy and was never held for very long, this was a very serious incident for her. We don't know exactly how long she was at the House of Refuge, but it was at least a few months and possibly as long as a year. So uh, she was trained in servant's work. And when she got out, the idea was that she would be able to earn a living on the bottom rung of society. Sophie decided that this life was not for her. So instead of going straight, when she got out, she went right back to pickpocketing and shoplifting. As a teenage girl, Sophie uh, improved her pickpocketing and shoplifting skills with the help of a woman named Frederica Mandelbaum. Marm, as she was called, was a German immigrant to New York City who'd become a phenomenally successful fence. She sold stolen goods outside of her dry goods store in the, in, on the Lower East Side. She also helped plan burglaries and kept storehouses of stolen goods in various parts of New York City. So Marm taught Sophie tips about the legal system, such as how important it was to hire a good lawyer who could get his clients released quickly with bail so they could get back to work. And on the social side, Marm was famous for the fancy party she threw in her own criminal with whom she worked. Sophie met and became friends with many professional criminals in New York City through Marm Mandelbaum. Marm was eventually arrest, arrested. She jumped her bail. She fled to Canada with her fortune. She was never convicted of a crime and she died a wealthy woman in Toronto. This drawing of Sophie on the left that you see was based on a police photo that was taken in the mid 1860s when she was using her mother's maiden name, Levy, as an alias. She was still a teenager, but by then she'd already been married briefly to a petty criminal named Maury Harris. Allegedly, it was at one of Mar Mandelbaum's parties that Sophie met Ned Lyons, the man you see on the right. Ned was an Irish born bank burglar, burglar from Massachusetts and he had a violent temper, but he had a reputation as a talented bank robber in Gotham's criminal underworld. So Sophie and Ned fell in love 
and were married just before Christmas in 1865. Ned was 26, Sophie had just turned 18. So this, this photo you see of Ned on the right was taken in 1881 when he was recuperating in a hospital after a burglary had ended in a shootout uh, with police. And it was terrible for identification, obviously, but it was the only photo the police managed to get of him. And they were desperate for photos of high profile criminals like Ned Lyons. So let's talk a minute about bank burglary in the 19th century, um, <clears throat> because you'll hear a lot more about it when we get to Dillinger. Bank burglars like Ned Lyons were at the top of the criminal hierarchy in the 19th century. If in a successful bank robbery, a big bank in New York City, um, for instance, the crooks often made off with huge amounts of cash, bonds, and valuables. But these were crimes that took planning, skill, patience. Unlike in, Dillinger, in Dillinger's time, these bank robberies generally weren't accomplished using guns. So in 1869, Ned and several partners leased the basement below the Ocean Bank building at Greenwich and Fulton Streets in Lower Manhattan. Working at night over the course of several weeks, they drilled through the ceiling of the bank, which was the floor, uh, I'm sorry, the ceiling of the uh, basement, which was the floor of the bank. And then on a Sunday when the vault, uh, when the bank wasn't guarded, they removed the last of the flooring and broke into the vault. They made off with a fortune estimated to be worth between half a million and a million dollars. And that is in the currency of that time. The bankers didn't want to admit publicly exactly how much money had been stolen because they were so embarrassed that they had left the bank unguarded. Now, Ned and Sophie could have retired from crime right then and there. They would have been enormously wealthy, but they did not. Ned actually truly enjoyed robbing banks and Sophie enjoyed pickpocketing and shoplifting. Both of them were eventually caught and convicted of, the, of those crimes. And so it was that in 1871, they ended up together at Sing Sing Prison 30 miles north of New York City. In an early December, 1872, Ned was able to escape from Sing Sing through an elaborate plot he had hatched with the help of colleagues outside the prison walls and also using some of the money that he'd stolen from the Ocean Bank. So just before Christmas, he returned and helped Sophie escape from the women's prison. They went to New York City, picked up their children and fled to Canada. Now, unlike the typical woman of the time, Sophie had no plans to give up her career to keep the home fires burning. Nonetheless, between 1866 and 1891, she had at least seven children. Only four of them lived to adulthood, the ones you see here, Florence, Victor, Charlotte, and Sophia. She placed her children in boarding schools and continued to work as a criminal all throughout their childhoods. Sophie's lifestyle, however, took a very hard toll on her children. When she was incarcerated, she wasn't able to pay school bills. So Florence, Victor, and Charlotte, who were Ned's children, were placed in poor houses and orphanages. By the late 1870s, Ned was in prison again, and Sophie had to be earning a living on her own. She came up for, uh, with a new plan for cash for raising cash, honey traps for the purposes of blackmail. What you are looking at here is the Revere House Hotel in Boston, Massachusetts. This was one of the premier hotels at that time in Boston. So <clears throat> posing as a wealthy woman, this was what Sophie would do. She would check into the best hotel in town and then lure a rich, respectable man to her room on the pretense of conducting business often a real estate transaction. Once he was in the door, Sophie would remove her clothing and suggest the man get into bed with her. The man usually took the bait. Next, she either threw his clothes out the window or locked them in a trunk. And then she would demand that he write her a check payable to her to get his clothes back so that he could leave the building without embarrassment. Uh, the men generally complied with her demands. <clears throat> 
So this was a clever scam and it netted her large amounts of cash for several years. But when she tried to play this, this uh, game at, at the Revere House, she was caught because the uh, clerk at the bank was a little more careful than, than some and he uh, questioned the check and he called the police and she was arrested. Now the 19th century was a time obviously of very few identification records and it was the golden age of avoiding arrest and incarceration by, by trying by keeping people guessing about who you were. So Sophie had a very long list of aliases and this is just part of some of them. On the occasions when she was arrested, she remembered the lesson she learned from Marm Mandelbaum, hire a good lawyer. In court, she also made sure to, to wear an elaborate hat with a veil and she did this to confuse witnesses and make it difficult for them to recognize her. Amazingly, this was usually allowed in court because decent women were expected to cover themselves up in public. So ironically, Sophie used this to her devious advantage. She was very smart. She was able to think quickly on her feet. Uh, and when she was arrested, she could come up with elaborate stories, casting herself as the victim frequently. And it also helped that she was able to cry on demand. She used all of these techniques when she was on trial in Boston for blackmail. No one was sure who she was, not even her victim, or so he claimed at least. Eventually the charges against her were dropped. And about this time, Sophie moved to Detroit, Detroit, Michigan, um, where she established a home base Detroit was a bustling city. It was ideally located for criminals because of the easy access to Windsor, Canada, right across the Detroit River. And uh, in Canada, Americans were outside the jurisdiction of American law enforcement. So Sophie put her children in private Catholic uh, boarding schools in Windsor and uh, she established her home base in Detroit. And during the first, her first years in Detroit, the police did not know who she was. She was arrested for shoplifting and tried to commit suicide in jail. She was beginning to show signs of mental illness that would plague her for the rest of her life. She also began making pickpocketing expeditions around the Midwest. She particularly liked to go to larger cities in Ohio for these criminal adventures. She could easily get there by a train. So she would steal things and mail them back to mail whatever she'd stolen back to her housekeeper in Detroit. And eventually she was arrested. Uh, she had tried to shoot a Detroit man she blackmailed, but luckily for her, first of all, she missed. And uh, he decided not to, he did not want to testify against her in court. But in 1881, she was charged with pickpocketing in Ann Arbor, uh, the home of the University of Michigan, just a brief train ride away from Detroit. She was convicted in 1882, sentenced to the Detroit House of Correction, which you see here in this photo. Her attorney appealed her conviction. She got another trial. She was convicted again. They appealed again, and she was finally found not guilty in 1884. But meanwhile, she was in and out of prison and her personal life really suffered. One of her young daughters died in Canada. Another daughter was adopted without her permission. Uh, her young son was placed in the local poorhouse. And her old son who'd been sent to prison in 1881 in New York died there. Sophie had not seen Ned who was in prison again for years and she filed for divorce. So after she was finally cleared of the charges in Michigan, Sophie uh, spent time helping her new boyfriend, Billy Burke, pull, ro pull robberies around the country uh, by sneak thievery. Billy was quite a bit younger than Sophie, but that only increased his appeal. Uh, now sneak thieves were something that we don't really talk about anymore. They were part bank robber, part confidence operator. They stole money by tricking or distracting people. And often Sophie's role was to chat a bank employee up while Billy nabbed any unsecured cash that was lying around. Sometimes Billy would use a retractable pincers on the end of his umbrella to extend his reach. 
Sophie and Billy were also penny waiters. These were thieves who stole jewel from jewelry stores by substituting a paste gem for a real one. And again, this crime required nerve, acting skills, and sleight of hand. Uh, these were skills that they both had in spades. But Billy ended up in prison also. So while Billy was in prison for a bank robbery that went bad in Kentucky, Sophie made her way to Europe in 1888. And she paired up there with a bank robber and con man named Big Jim Brady. Now, please, I wanna make sure you note that this was not the famous businessman Diamond Jim Brady. Uh, so no police department ever got a photo of Big Jim Brady despite the fact that he had a criminal history that stretched all the way back to his teenage years in upstate New York. Sophie and Jim conned wealthy people they met at high-end hotels into believing that they were trustworthy and wealthy themselves. And then they robbed them. And after Sophie had a near miss with the police in Paris, she and Jim returned to Detroit, worked the crowds at the international exposition and fair that was going on there. So they were doing some pickpocketing. And then in 1890, they went back to Europe, they went to London and there they got married, despite the fact that Sophie was still married to Ned Lyons. Her divorce was not finalized yet. And at age 43, she had her last child, a daughter named Sophia. So Sophie came back to Detroit. Uh, she continued to be involved in criminal enterprises there, but as the 20th century dawned, she was becoming so well known, it was getting to be difficult to uh, continue with that, that kind of crime she'd been involved in. So she began to buy up real estate and earn an honest income as a landlord. She began to claim actually that she had totally given up crime. And in 1913, she published her memoir, Why Crime Does Not Pay. The book is full of stories of the criminal adventures of, of people she knew and, and of herself. And it's entertaining and contains a lot of stories that she make, made up, mixed in with facts here and there. Uh, the title of the book was almost certainly tongue in cheek. Sophie was a wealthy woman by the time she wrote it but the foundation of her wealth was stolen. She had mostly given up crime, but she was still helping Billy Burke, uh, whom she ha had actually finally married in 1910. Uh, Billy uh, continued to be a criminal until nearly the end of his life. And he spent a lot of time in prison and she was often trying to help him get out of prison. So in her later years, Sophie really tried hard to improve her public image through charitable work. And much of it was done with a, an organization in Detroit called the Pathfinders. The Pathfinders had the goal of helping prisoners learn better life habits uh, through and to help them rehabilitate and go straight when they got out. Sophie certainly knew firsthand the damage incarceration inflict, could inflict on a person's life because it had pretty much destroyed hers for many years. She passionately supported prison reform and the idea that ex-prisoners needed help from society after their release. She also ridiculed people who used guns. She thought criminals should use intelligence and skill to, make, to commit crimes instead of threats of violence. The truth was though that she was proud of her legacy as a successful criminal woman. And that pride cost her any chance of rehabilitating her reputation. She also suffered from undiagnosed mental illness, probably bipolar disorder and PTSD from her violent childhood. Her mental illness often caused her to behave bizarrely in public and she would, when she would argue violently with friends and neighbors. So she died of a stroke in Detroit in 1924. And at the time of her death, many people weren't convinced she'd ever reformed. Now, Sophie's estate was worth $240,000 when she died, and that's over three and a half million uh, dollars in today's dollars. Three of her children were still alive at that time, yet she left instructions that most of her money was to go to, established a, to establish a home in Detroit for the children of criminals, named after her, of course. <laughs> 
Sophie's daughter, Florence Lyons, who you see here on the right, uh, fought the estate and took it all the way to the Michigan Supreme Court. Florence prevailed ultimately in the court and a portion of her mother's estate went to support her disabled sister who was living in an, ins in an insane asylum in England. So the legacy of Sophie Lyons was a mixed one. She lived most of her life on the wrong side of the law and she was proud of that fact. So now I'll turn the microphone over to my friend Denise and she'll tell you about two women who were on the right side of the law and their clients who most definitely were not. Thank you, Shane. All right, well, by 1920, when women were given the right to vote, all states admitted women to the bar but however, not every state allowed women to serve on juries. So what this meant was many women attorneys weren't considered real lawyers and they were forced to accept jobs as stenographers or librarians in law firms. Few women found work in litigation and even fewer practiced criminal law. Women in the courtroom were considered a novelty and often not taken seriously. So please meet two Mavericks who bucked convention by practicing criminal law during the golden age of the gangster. Our first is Jesse Levy. Jesse was born in Siany, Russia, which is now part of northeastern Poland, and she was born on July 6, 1898. She was the eldest of four daughters in an Orthodox Jewish family. In June of 1904, the family immigrated to America, and they finally ended up in South Bend, Indiana. Um, Jesse dropped out of school at the age of 16 to help support her family, and she found work in an attorney's office, which is probably where she first got interested in taking up the law. And at the same time, she also became a reporter for the South Bend local newspaper. Several years later, she took a job in an appellate judge's office and began taking classes at the university. In 1918, she became the first woman admitted to the Indiana University of Law. At the same time, she returned to earn her high school diploma at Short Ridge High School in Indianapolis. And with her spare time, if you can believe that she had any, uh, she uh, used that as a law clerk. This is a picture of Jessie just shortly after she graduated from law school. Um, Jessie was first and foremost always a suffragist. She became an attorney to focus on, in on women's issues, especially married women's issues. And again, like I said, as Shane had said earlier, um, married women often uh, lacked legal means to control their own destiny. Um, she, this is a, an article from uh, the 1960s, 1966. And uh, they did an interview for her because it was the uh, uh, anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And after that 19th Amendment had gotten passed, Jesse cautioned a reporter not to expect suffrage to automatically change things except for giving us the right to vote. So how did somebody that was interested in women's issues and suffrage and things like that ever get hooked in with John Dillinger? Well, handsome Harry Pierpont is, is the, uh, the answer. For Jesse Levy, paid customers were a spare, scarce commodity. Most of her business came from divorce cases. But on June 1st, 1925, she embarked on her first major criminal case. She um, had as a client Earl the Kid Northern. He was a 22 year old bank robber who belonged to a gang headed by handsome Harry Pierpont. And Pierpont was the same age as, as Earl the Kid Northern, but he was considered a career criminal already. And handsome Harry Pierpont would go on to become the mentor of John Dillinger. And he's often been credited as being the brains behind the Dillinger. So in a courtroom that was jam-packed with spectators that were really interested in seeing a woman attorney for the first time, Jesse Levy was able to achieve a better than expected outcome for Earl the Kid Northern using Harry Pierpont as a key witness. Our second attorney that I'd like to talk about today is Bess Robbins. She was six years younger than Jesse, but had a similar background. Um, she also went to the Indiana, Indiana University of Law School and uh, she had graduated early from it. She had to wait, um, once she graduated, she had to wait a, uh, a bit until she turned 21 so that she could actually practice law. And in addition to women's issues, Bess was also keenly interested in prison reform and revamping the parole system. And kind of a real interesting tidbit, uh, John Dillinger would be one of a group of convicts whose parole she convinced the Indiana governor to expedite. So Bess was also, besides being an attorney, she was into politics. She was one of the earliest women to serve in the Indiana House of Representatives, and she was the first woman elected to uh, serve three consecutive terms in 1933, 1935, and 1937. And in this article, Bess is quoted as saying she enjoys her criminal work perhaps more than any other phase, 
And in the future, she hoped for a straight murder case. Her nearest being so far was a case of assault and battery with intent to kill. So pretty soon she would get her wish. All right. Um, yeah, we've talked about John Dillinger here a little bit. <laughs> let's let's actually get into a, a bit about his story. Um, surprisingly, John Dillinger had a very short career as a bank robber. It was approximately from May or June of 1933 to July of 1934. But when he was in the penitentiary at Michigan City, he became friends with a clique of bank robbers. And seeing that he was going to get paroled earlier than the rest of them, the leader of the group, Harry Pierpont, who we, we've talked about a little bit before, actually trained John Dillinger to be the outside man to facilitate their escape. So once outside, John Dillinger began robbing banks to raise money for what would become the largest prison break to date. The bank above is Bluffton, Ohio, where I was born. It was the one that I actually, uh, when I was a kid, had a passbook savings account at. Um, it's also the beginning of the Dillinger saga. He went around and he was robbing all these little banks in Indiana, in Ohio, uh, in Kentucky, and probably a few other places too that they're not quite sure of. And, uh, um, you know, it was earning money for this prison break. Several days before that prison break, though, was supposed to be scheduled to take place, John Dillinger got caught in Dayton, Ohio, while visiting a girlfriend. So he was actually in jail when the prison break, break took place. So what happened was, instead of being sent back to Indiana, where he committed these robberies of a much higher dollar amount, his, uh, Dillinger's lawyer got him transferred to the Allen County Jail in Lima, Ohio. In the meantime, the prison break took place on September 26th in 1934. Ten convicts broke out of the Indiana State Penitentiary at Michigan City, Indiana. When they heard of, great, of John Dillinger's predicament, they uh, were grateful for his assistance and they decided to hatch plans to return the favor to get him, break him out of jail. So what happened was on October 12th, 1933, five escaped prisoners, it was Harry Pierpont, Charles Makeley, Russell Clark, Ed Schaus and John Hamilton, along with Dillinger's bank robbery accomplice, Harry Copeland, rolled into Lima, Ohio to break John Dillinger out of jail. Furious because the $10,000 bribe the gang paid had not resulted in Dillinger's release, Harry Pierpont shot and then pistol whipped Sheriff Jess Sarber during the jailbreak. Sarber died on the operating ta as a table as a result of these injuries a little over an hour later. John Dillinger and those six who helped him escape, along with Harry Pierpont's girlfriend, Mary Northern Kinder, who happened to be Earl the Kid Northern's younger sister, formed the nucleus of the first Dillinger gang and became a rampage of crime across the Midwest. Their first stop was the Auburn uh, Police Station in Indiana, where they locked up the officers and made off with weapons and ammunition. This would be the first of three police stations that the Dillinger gang hit over the next few months. Next, they moved on to robbing banks in Greencastle, Indiana, Racine, Wisconsin, and East Chicago, Indiana. And in the process, two more officers of the law died during some high profile shootouts. Law enforcement throughout the country considered the Dillinger gang extremely dangerous. So by now, every move of the gang was considered newsworthy. When Tucson, Arizona police captured five members without be a shot being fired, the event made front page headlines around the world. And this is when Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins became involved. Jesse would represent Harry Pierpont, Charles Makeley, Russell Clark, and Mary Kinder, while Bess's clients were Harry Copeland and Milton Crouch. So what happened was eventually it was agreed on at, 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 out at Tucson that Harry Pierpont, Makeley, and Russell Clark would be returned to Lima, Ohio to face charges of murdering the sheriff, while uh, John Dillinger was sent to Crown Point, Indiana. The armed gentleman you see there in the photo standing behind Harry Pierpont is Don Sarber, who was appointed the interim sheriff after his father died. At 24 years old, he was the youngest sheriff in the country at the time. And to add even more pressure to, um, to the job that he was already trying to do, Don's mother happened to be one of the eyewitnesses to his father's assault and subsequent death. The second of Jesse Levy's clients was Charles Makeley. And although Charles, although uh, Jeff, Sheriff Jess Sarber had told his son and some other people before he died, that his assailants were all big men. Charles Makeley was one of the shortest members of the gang. He stood at about five foot seven. He would be tried for murder because one of the other members of the gang that actually probably was one of the ones that, that was, were in there to uh, help assault uh, Sheriff Sarber uh, wasn't able to be extradited back to Ohio. Bess Robbins blocked the extradition of her client, Harry Copeland, who stood at about six foot tall. The third member that Jesse Levy represented was Russell Clark. He stood at about six foot one. 
Each of the three tr murder trials that Jesse participated in ran back to back. So what meant, that meant was a, when the jury reached a verdict for one man, the next man's trial would start on the following Monday. So in the case of Russell Clark, this left Jesse Levy with less than 24 hours to prepare. And another problem with these trials being held so closely together was that the transcripts were often delayed by a day or so, which really made it difficult for the attorneys to dis discover any discrepancies that happened to be in the eyewitness testimony. What added even more excitement to the trials was two days before the first uh, murder trial, which was Harry Pierpont's, John Dillinger escapes. He uh, supposedly uh, carved a, a wooden gun and uh, used that to bluff his way out uh, of the Crown Point Jail in Indiana. So after receiving multiple threats, Pierpont's attorney quit the night before the start of, of the trial. Confident that they chased off any competent attorney, the prosecution was shocked when Jesse Levy arrived the next morning to defend Harry Pierpont. So things were already crazy in Ohio. It got even more crazy. The National Guard were called in, machine gun nests were built, and all the train stations and roads leading into Lima had checkpoints for anyone going into the city. Anyone who entered that courthouse, with the exception of the judge and the prosecution, were subjected to a standard Detective Bureau body search. Uh, during the, the uh, questioning of the jury, um, again, what would happen was while interviewing prospective jurors, when it became Jesse Levy's turn to ask questions, the National Guard would begin target practice outside the courthouse. It got even more uh, interesting because during the second day of Harry Pierpont's trial, John Dillinger and his new gang, including Babyface Nelson, robbed the Security National Bank and Trust Company of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And uh, it uh, just kind of went from there. Four jailbreaks, three murder trials, two stays of execution, and a case dismissed. Uh, later came these headlines. And that top one is the courtesy of the special agent in charge of the FBI's Indianapolis office. Um, so when you read these, I mean, it really runs the gamut of, uh, you know, of how, how uh, uh, Jesse Levy was regarded uh, in, in how she represented these, these folks. I mean, everything from that she was on the take to uh, that she was very competent. Um, and I guess you can kind of ask ourselves, how, what, what can we take away from these clippings about how uh, Jesse and Bess were considered? Well, their legacy is, is a good one. Um, uh, uh, Jesse was one of six Indiana women to attend the, national, the first National Association of Women's Lawyers Conference, which this is the group shot that you're seeing. And both she and Bess did a lot to uh, uh, fight against protective le uh, legislation. Um, and protective legislation is basically discriminatory practices and laws that restrict women's access or women, the other minorities access to the courtroom and the office. And what this boils down to is really the 19th Amendment didn't guarantee any woman the vote. Instead, laws reserving the ballot for men became unconstitutional. Women still had to navigate a maze of state laws meant to keep them from exercising their rights. And this is where Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins really made their most lasting contributions. Their unwillingness to back down in the, from the causes they believed in, as, as, as they demonstrated so well with the Dillinger gang, served them well. History may have forgotten about Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins, but the legacy they left behind still remains. So just a few final thoughts about Sophie Lyons and, and uh, Jesse and Bess. Sophie Lyons spent most of her life as a criminal at a time when there were few female professional criminals. Their li that lifestyle, it had a lot of challenges, yet it seemed in the long run to serve her well. She ended up wealthy and is still one of the best known criminals from that era. On the other hand, Jesse and Bess were law-abiding women who pursued atypical careers as attorneys. They weren't afraid to represent the outcasts of society, including criminals, but times and the changing social norms eventually forced them to put this part of their careers behind them. When books on the John Dillinger gang began to enter the marketplace, attorneys Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins vanished from the record. It, it became a boys only club with just a handful of passing references told from the perspective of what made a good story. And really nothing much pertaining to fact. And oftentimes they were, they were dismissed as being incompetent or, or kind of on the take. So hopefully our attitudes are changing. I'd like to share a quote from Jeanette Bates, one of the first women to join an attorney general's office. It kind of sums up things pretty well, I think, for the three women on the opposite sides of the law. Some women will make good in the courts, some in the kitchen. A woman's place is wherever she makes good. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? <laughs>
Thanks, Shane and Denise. Sure, thank you. Yeah, yeah no, that was great. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. Okay. I know I have one question um, for you, Shane. I know that you said that um, Sophie wrote her memoir um, later on in her life and I can imagine there were a lot of interesting deals in there, details in there. Yeah. And I'm wondering if any of those were incriminating to anybody. Incriminating. Yeah. Oh, well, they were incriminating, but the things had happened so long in the past that it wasn't like anybody was going to, you know, be charged with a crime at that point because it had all, it was mostly stuff that had happened in the 1880s. So uh, she wasn't revealing anything crucial to anyone. And she did get, she also got a lot of things wrong. Uh, I think she was using, oftentimes she was using newspaper uh, stories as the basis of, and then she was retelling them as if she had experienced the event itself, but she, she probably had not. Gotcha, so an, enough time had passed. Yes, a lot of time had passed, but, which is not, but that is not to say that she did not have enemies. She definitely had enemies. There were people who hated her, other criminals who hated her, without a doubt. <laughs> so. <laughs> so we have a few more um, questions coming in. Um, one of them is uh, for either, for either of you guys to answer. Um, somebody wanted to know, um, the role of Sophie's Jewish identity or of any of the other criminals? Well, Sophie really, uh, she said she would make claims like that her grandfather was a rabbi. There's no uh, evidence that that was actually true. Uh, but primarily she, she wasn't religious and she raised her kids mostly Catholic because her husbands were, uh, other than her first husband, Maury Harris, who was Jewish, the other husbands were all Irish Catholics. So most of the kids were raised Catholic, but she herself didn't, was not religious, I would say. Okay, great. Um, and then we have another question, um, which is how both of you guys got interested in these historical figures and were inspired to write about them. I had, I guess, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one at least at first. I had grown up in uh, a, a part of Ohio, Northwest Ohio, where there was a lot of John Dillinger activity. And I heard a lot of stories besides uh, just the Bluffton Bank robbery. My maternal grandmother actually met one of the um, members of the, the Dillinger gang. So she had those stories to tell. So I was interested from a pretty early, early age on. And um, I actually purchased a copy of Thomas Burns' Professional Criminals of America that I, I purchased it at a, a bookshop in Detroit, a rare bookshop. And I, it, I believe it was owned by, it was certainly owned by Sophie's daughter, Florence Lyons. And it may have been Sophie's copy uh, because she, uh, when she died, she willed all of her uh, things in her house to Florence. And so that got me interested in trying to figure out uh, if it was really Florence's book and sort of building, I started building a family tree for Sophie. I wanted to see if I could actually, how difficult it would be to build a family tree for somebody who basically lied about themselves their entire <laughs> lives. And uh, it was hard, <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, there were so many things written about her uh, in the newspapers that that was, pretty helpful. Also, I happened to live in Ann Arbor about three blocks from where Sophie did her pickpocketing that landed her in the Detroit House of Correction. So those are, that's what got me interested. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Ed from the library. Um, oh, there's another question again about uh, uh, how being a Jewish immigrant uh, uh, did being a Jewish immigrant play a role in Sophie's reactions 
to fitting into high society? Were there barriers that kept her in a life of crime? Um, did she feel like she only didn't really have a choice as to transition out of a life of crime? Well, it's hard to know. Uh, it's, I mean, she started in crime so early since her parents basically forced her to be a criminal. It's really hard to know um, whether she would have gone a different route if she'd had a normal childhood. Um, but, you know, one of her main, I would say as, as a young adult, one of her main um, mentors was Mar Mandelbaum. And, you know, anybody who, who knows anything about crime in the 19th century, particularly in New York City, knows that Marm was a hugely influential person in uh, the crime circles uh, in New York City because she was so successful as a fence. So um, I, you know, she was another uh, influence. So I, I, you know, it's, but again, it's hard to know with Sophie since she, she wasn't, she didn't want to be, she didn't want to be very honest about what was going on when she was finally talking about her own life because she was really trying to rehabilitate herself and make herself seem like she hadn't done some of the things she had actually done. So, yeah, I understand. And she, you know, she did do some good things towards, towards the latter part of her life, but it's just not, it, it's a very, she had a very mixed legacy. So we're not going to be able to say, oh, she, you know, she had this terrible childhood and then she reformed and went, went, you know, went good. Um, it's just, a, it's a, it's a, her story is so fascinating because it's, it defies, you know, any kind of simple retelling, I would say. Thank you. Um, let's see. Do we, did, did they get any, uh, did any of the defendants get off? I'm assuming you're talking about Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins clients. Um, the uh, two of the, of the uh, defendants uh, ended up uh, getting convicted for murder. Um, the third one, she um, got, got off of those charges. Another case was dismissed. And then uh, both of Bess Robbins' clients, they basically plea, plea bargained down. And I guess the, the other thing, the details on that, you're going to have to read the book. But uh, hopefully, hopefully that will uh, that will answer some of the questions. Uh, there's also a question about Sophie's children. Uh, I I spent a lot of my time trying to locate her children uh, and find out what happened to them. And um, the child that I was most interested in tracing was her daughter, who was the uh, the child she had with Big Jim Brady. And uh, that daughter was born in England, so she was a citizen, a British citizen, and she ended up in a mental institution. She actually ended up in uh, Bethlehem Asylum, which is sometimes called Bedlam Asylum. She ended up there uh, around the time of, not, of World War I, and she never got out of uh, mental institutions. She spent her entire life, she didn't die until 1963, but she spent her entire life in mental institutions, which is truly devastating and terribly sad. And uh, I would love to be able to find out more about her. But um, anyway, uh, I also, there was another daughter who ended up in uh, England and died in England. She ended up in a series of workhouses in England and she died there also, so. Um, so did we answer the anti-Semitism question? Uh, I mean, I'm sure that anti-Semitism played a role because, uh, you know, Jews coming to New York or to the America in the mid 19th century were certainly not particularly welcomed at all. So that had to have played a role in how the family was treated. Uh, but also, the, you know, there were other groups, the Irish were also quite hated, so it's kind of hard to sort it out. Um, Let's see. Uh, do you have any other historical books on women? 
I'm working on one right now about, uh, actually, uh, it takes place in Kalos Park and uh, Morgan Park. There's a murder that took place in 1924 that involves, involves uh, uh, some women. So uh, uh, that's coming up. Were the, were the women lawyers supportive of the suffrage movement? Uh, yeah, <laughs> most, most of them were. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there were there were a few that uh, um, were more so than than others. Uh, it was just really interesting because in um, Indiana, in the Midwest, um, you really didn't have um, as it is. It wasn't nearly as progressive as as uh, west of the Mississippi River, and that's kind of because these territories like Wyoming, uh, Utah, um, Colorado when they wanted to become states, they didn't have enough warm bodies um, with the men, so they began to bring in women, um, that women served on juries, women served on grand juries, women became bailiffs, things like that. So it, it was way more accepted for a woman to have a role in the courts out west, west of the, of the Mississippi than it was definitely back east. So, um, um, and you, you, women attorneys as a, as a whole, um, they, they really had them, slotted into just certain roles. You didn't really have anybody, it was very, very rare that they practiced criminal law with any any um, length of time. I mean, you might take a case or two, but then um, that was it. And so, like I said, again, this was kind of why Jesse and Bess, it was really interesting because they were they were really in there mixing it up uh, in, a, in, a, in a part of the field, law field that, that really didn't welcome women at all. So somebody wanted to know about the Pathfinders, the organization. Uh, it wasn't a, a, an organization for the children of criminals. It was an organization for to help criminals as they got out of prison to help with rehabilitation, which I'm not an expert in that area. I'm sure it was not, not very good at all. We're talking about the uh, early 20th century. I'm sure it was difficult. And uh, the, so the Pathfinders was a good, was a good group. They had a, a good um, goal, uh, but I really don't know any more about, uh, about they, they petered out by the 1940s. Uh, they're not in, in, they're not active anymore. So, and somebody also wondered if there are any living descendants of Sophie Lyons. Um, Sophie, and where she's buried. Sophie's buried in Woodmere Cemetery in Detroit, which is a cemetery where a lot of illustrious people are buried, like Henry Ford, for instance, is buried there. Um, it was for the bigwigs of uh, Detroit, but ordinary people too. That her son who predeceased her, her son, uh, Victor, who she was very close to, uh, predeceased her by a couple of years. And she, uh, he had served in the Spanish-American War, and uh, the, some of his uh, people in an organization for that group uh, helped get him a burial, a cremation slot there, and then she was cremated and buried in the same, buried with him. And um, I really, Sophie had, nobody knows exactly how many children she had because she would say different things at different times. Um, it may have been as many as 10. Of course, some of those children may have died, you know, right after birth, we, we don't really know. But I really tried hard to figure out if she did have any living descendants and I don't believe she did because she only had one grandchild that was, uh, that was anybody knows anything about. And that was her daughter, Florence's daughter. And uh, it appears that she, that, daughter did not have any children. So apparently there are no living descendants of Sophie Lyons. <laughs> Great, are there any more questions? I have one more if we have time for that. Um, sure. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more about what the research process looked like for both of you. Um, I know Denise, you were showing some new paper clippings here and there. And I'm just wondering what putting all of that together looked like. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely did newspapers. I was also lucky enough, um, both Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins wrote a fair amount. And they also, there was a fair amount of courts transcripts that were left over from some of these cases. I think it, it's kind of interesting 
you know, nowadays it, it, we, we save everything or, uh, you know, there's a lot more transcripts and legal documents saved. Uh, back then, they really didn't, didn't uh, keep all that many things, but I was lucky with that. Um, I was lucky to run into a couple just separate interviews, standalone interviews that the women gave. Um, neither one of them had children. Uh, neither one of them have any uh, um, real close living um, de descendants. So that part uh, was a little bit tough, but uh, it was something that, that uh, had been a project of mine that went over quite a few years. I, I kind of started researching the Dillinger gang first, and I'd always wanted to write a book about them, but I never had a really good... Um, something I felt really passionately about, I guess. So uh, uh, when I discovered about Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins, that that uh, made the process a lot quicker. And, let's and, and I was able to discover that uh, surprisingly, especially given what Denise just said, a lot of the Detroit, uh, Detroit court records from the 1880s, now we're going back 140 years here. They still exist at the Library of Michigan. It's absolutely amazing. I discovered that they're there. You can look through them. You know, you can, there are these yellowing pages. Everything was written by hand. There were no typewriters. They're hard to decipher. But those court records for most of the, uh, the court cases that Sophie was involved in in Detroit are still there. And the um, uh, her appe the appeal of the closure of her probate to the Michigan Supreme Court was also at the Library of Michigan. It's an amazing document. It's huge. It contains many depositions from people who knew her well, and it also includes a paperback copy of her memoir, which is was sort of put in with all of these papers. There must be like 250 pages of depositions. And then there's the paperback book and it's all like bundled together. And I don't think anybody had looked at it in years and years and years when I discovered it. And uh, I opened it up and I showed it to some of the archivists and they were like, wow, <laughs> what is this thing? <laughs> And apparently it was too expensive to uh, have a court reporter or whoever would do that transcribe the whole memoir. So they just took the pa a paperback copy and shoved it in with the rest of the stuff. So uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, that is really amazing, especially about the court transcripts and how long, you know, they've been able to preserve those. That's great. Yeah, we're lucky. So we had one more question come through the chat and um, somebody wants to know how long it took um, for each of your books from start to finish, um, which I guess could involve the research process yeah, and the yeah. writing, yeah. It, the uh, Dillinger part probably took over 10 years. The, uh, uh, when I added in Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins, uh, probably two years. So I had, I had done a lot of research prior to that about the Dillinger gang and different, different parts of that. Um, and then, when, like I said, when I found uh, the ladies, that uh, it, it really inspired me. It really, really went really fast. And I'm not going to be anywhere near as impressive as Denise. I'd say it took me about two and a half years to do the research and write the book. So. <laughs> oh, and whoever wrote good luck, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it certainly takes a lot of dedication to put something like this together in both of your cases. So thanks for joining us today and for sharing all of this with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. We appreciate it too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes.